Hello and welcome to the World Soccer Talk podcast, your weekly dose of talking about watching soccer on TV, online, and apps. Coming up on episode seventy-three, we discuss several topics, including the end of an era at Fox Soccer for、uh, soccer rights, and also we've got some news about ITV. And BBC sending their World Cup teams to Russia 2018, as well as Turner Sports making some big announcements、uh, regarding their Champions League coverage and much, much more. Plus, of course, we've got letters from you, the listeners,、uh, in our mail- mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, aka the Gaffer, and I'm joined today by Kartik Krishnaya. Now, Kartik, we've got a lot to get to. It's getting.、Um, To the end of the season, the Premier League is over.、Um, some of the、uh, La Liga, Serie A is wrapping up this weekend, and、uh, of course, we're, we're getting into the the World Cup cycle with the twenty three man squads、uh, being named. But、um, before we dive into what we've been watching, I mean, really, the kind of the big news that's come out、um, this week really is again with Fox Sports. So in last week's episode, we talked about uh, Comcast, uh, which owns NBC. Trying to gobble up、uh, Fox Sports, and、uh, I, I made an error. I, I, so I, I apologize. But、um, what I did mention on that podcast is that、uh, they were looking at, say, FS1 and FS2, and that could be a, an NBC1 and NBC2. Well, FS1 and FS2 and the big Fox are not going to be included in this package. What Fox has done is they're in the process of creating a spin-off company, which would include Fox, Fox News,、uh, FS1 and FS2, and it's going to be branded. Uh, the new Fox, and that's going to be、um, owned or actually run by Rupert Murdoch's son. And then with that, then too, is that、uh, they're going to have that as a separate company, and then sell off 21st Century Fox,、uh, which does include all of the Fox regional channels. And it's either going to go to Disney or to Comcast. So there's a big fight there、uh, between the big giants to figure out who's going to get it.、Uh, ultimately, you never know. This new Fox, this this big spinoff. Ultimately, maybe that be- becomes sold in the future too, but、uh, probably not at this point. But so let's、uh, dive in, Kartik.、Um, speaking of Fox,、um, I mean, there's a lot, been a lot of changes,、uh, and it's happening right now. And, and and that's really over the next week is we're saying goodbye to Fox with the Europa League coverage、uh, this weekend with their final、uh, FA Cup match. And then the weekend, and after that, we with the、uh, the Champions League. So lots of changes at Fox, and、uh, lots of things ending.、Uh, what are your thoughts on this so far? Well, I was at the Sportel conference、uh, this week at、uh, the Sportel summit, and don't want to get too deep into everything that went on there. But、uh, this was a big topic of conversation: was Fox's、uh, sort of dismantling of、uh, of soccer and, and, and sports rights in general, regional sports networks. Will they end up with Comcast? Will they end up with Disney? Disney has the bid, obviously already tabled.、Uh, Lot of talk about B Sky B. I think the general sense is that Fox、um, is having some problems in terms of advertisers, sponsors, and ratings with FS1 and FS2 in general, not just soccer programming in general. And、um, there are missing returns for their other. 21st Century Fox properties, cable channels, and the transition of Rupert Murdoch handing this off to James Murdoch and and and, and the family,、uh, all happening at once. We saw this transition from Fox News Channel here in the states with、uh, Rupert Rails、uh, being removed, sexual harassment charges, and James Murdoch taking on and、uh, coming in, and it's a little bit of a change in direction there、uh, at Fox News Channel. So、uh, big topics, big conversations. The thing that in the short term, soccer fans. Uh, need to know is that Fox is retrenching a bit, and that means they will continue global Bundesliga rights,、uh, at least、uh, for the U.S. market for the next two years, next fall, our、uh, next two seasons.、Uh, but FA Cup ends this Saturday.、Uh, Europa League is done as of the Marseille Atleti final、uh, yesterday, as we report this on Thursday, and then we've got a、um, a match,、uh, the, the Champions League final. That's it for them with、uh, UEFA. Yeah, so so with Fox's cover- coverage of soccer, it's going to change quite a bit. I mean, because somebody asked me on、uh, Twitter, they said,、uh, "What's going to happen to Lalas now with all these changes?" And I said, "Well, he's still going to do the co-commentaries on Major League Soccer games, and then every four years we'll get his、uh, analysis at、uh, World Cup tournaments.、Uh, of course, there's women's、uh, World Cup tournaments、uh, in between that too." 
And then beyond that, I guess Bundesliga maybe now and again. But I mean, well, if he was in the Bundesliga studio Saturday, yeah, on match day, where I have to say Fox uh, did a tremendous job. Um, they stuck with the coverage for an additional hour uh, into the next program. Uh, I thought they did a great job showing the the Hamburg situation, uh, Hamburg's first ever relegation uh, since the Bundesliga became a professional league, a fully professional league. Uh, so now there are only four clubs in major European leagues, in top five European leagues that have never been relegated uh, in their history. Um, Hamburg was one of five. Uh, I, I thought they did a really good job. We saw Lawless in that uh, situation able to add some some bits and pieces. His analysis is um, his analysis is kind of scattered for me. I mean, look, I, I thought as a co-commentator for the Marseille Atleti game, I don't know, I'm jumping ahead here, but Chris, he did pretty well. Yeah. So maybe he um, and he did well in the Arsenal uh, Atleti semifinal, the two legs. So maybe you see more of him as a co-commentator. They have to get some use out of him. So maybe he's going to be a commentator on Bundesliga games and in the studio for all these other things. And, and obviously co-commentator for MLS. Yeah, as an analyst, um, I don't know, he's all over the place. Sometimes he's really good and has some really good opinions, and other times, I, I don't know, it's just, just, it just doesn't seem as strong as he was when he was at ESPN. And again, that could be from the presenter, or that could be just in terms of the format. I'm, I'm not sure. Or even the other people uh, in, the, in the studio uh, kind of debating back and forth. I did think that uh, for the Europa League final, uh, when he had uh, Ian Joy... Mario Malkiot, Stu Holden, and Warren Barton. I thought all four of those did really well together as far as kind of the back and forth and discussion and some tough questions from me and Joy. That, that chemistry I like a lot better. Um, but with Lalas and, and actually with other Fox employees, you have to wonder once this World Cup is over and Champions League is gone, Europa League is gone, FA Cup is gone, um, Maybe some of these guys will actually be let go. I mean, maybe some of these guys will, especially the kind of the freelancers, the part timers that have been working for Fox. Um, it's going to be harder for them to find jobs there, and they'll probably flock to. I mean, Turner Sports, etc. We'll get more into that a little bit later. But going back, Kartik over over the years of all of these these Champions League games, FA Cup games, Europa League games uh, on Fox. Uh, what for you will you miss, and and what what for you will you not miss? Uh, uh, kind of the, the good and bad uh, of the last few years. Yeah, I um uh, the the funny thing is, Fortel, the very first panel I went I attended on on uh, Tuesday morning at, at the conference, there was an American uh, who's a, not not a soccer guy, but just a general American sports consultant who said that uh, UEFA Champions League is the most consistent branded product in the world of television. He was explaining how NFL NFL looks different on different networks, how um, uh, NBA looks different on different networks, how the Premier League looks different on different networks, but that the UEFA League is remarkably similar. So um, I guess the studio will be different, right? Although not entirely different. We've got some news we'll talk about in a little bit uh, as far as Turner's studio composition. But uh, I guess it may not be that different, the Champions League. What will I miss? I guess I might miss the fact that Fox shows every game. In, in yeah. one form or another, yeah. but the uh, accessibility. Uh, but I'm already, quite frankly, getting comfortable with the Bleacher Report platform. I'm, I'm more comfortable with it. Um, this is another topic of discussion today, uh, this week, that I had with some of the people around Sport Town, some of the other people around uh, the game uh, here locally in, in su Southern Florida, that Bleacher Report Live seems to be more user-friendly, at least to this point, than ESPN Plus. And uh, we were talking specifically about finding USL games on ESPN Plus and how difficult it is uh -huh. and how you get to scroll through even college softball to get there. Um, so I think Bluetooth Report Plus is going to be user friendly, but there is a pay component. That's what we'll miss about Fox, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, for me, uh, some of the highs over the last few years, not, 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 not just Champions League, but also FA Cup 2 and Europa League. Uh, one is um, really kind of the emergence of Stuart Holden and John Strong. Now, a lot of listeners probably don't like them. Uh, I do. I think they're, they're doing a great job. And Stu Holden especially is getting better and better game after game. His analysis is getting uh, really more concise, but also I mean, almost hard-hitting, kind of a, almost a Kyle Martino, Taylor Twelman uh, st style. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in and ask you a question? Sure. Um, the, I, I, I completely agree with you on Stu Holden. I think he's at that level of uh, 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 12 man or a Martino as an animal. So I have to tell you, this week at Sporto, Kyle Martino. Kyle Martino and Kay Murray are both rock stars. I'm just going to get that out there. Uh, Kay was unbelievable in how she handled her panels and the questions and the 
that she did. And Martino is point for point, I think, spot on on so much he says about U.S. soccer. But I, the question I have about Holden, is it his voice or that he seems like he's young? Because if you if you peel back and you listen to what he's saying, he's as good as they come. But um, the feedback I'm getting is people are, are kind of annoyed that he seems really young. And keep in mind, it's a player who had injuries and whose playing career was cut uh, dramatically short. Actually, that's the case with Martino and 12 and also. It's funny that there's a pattern that the, the three best American analysts, uh, for me, uh, co-commentators are all guys that, um, that, that whose playing careers were cut short. But keep in mind, Holden is, is younger uh, than you might think he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think he's uh, excitable. So uh, sometimes you hear kind of that uh, excited uh, voice from him. But uh, I, I, it hasn't been an issue for me. I, I've even I kind of listened to what he says, um, and the more I listen, the more I like. Uh, I think he's doing a great job. But some some of the other highs, Kartik, for me, um, production of games, whether it's Champions League or FA Cup or Europa League. Now, if you looked at it looked at what you were seeing over the last couple of years and then just pressed the mute button, you'd be like, okay, this looks great. This looks really crisp. Uh, the camera angles, the, the studio that they're using, they're obviously spending a lot of money. But then the lows, you'd unmute it and listen to the analysis. And for the most part, uh, up until recently, the analysis has just been just really very, very weak. Very um, stuff that you would an average soccer fan would already know would just kind of uh, tune out. Uh, but the actual look and feel of, of the coverage and, and, and of the production has been great. Uh, some of the lows, oh my gosh, there's been so many lows. I mean, obviously, Gus Johnson would be uh, at the top of the list. Uh, to me, like, second on the list is um, Stuart Holden and John Strong, although it wasn't their intention, I'm sure, uh, where Fox was trying to make, it, make them look that they were at uh, the Emirates Stadium uh, in London for one of the matches and, and to make him, make him look like they're there when they're actually in a studio in Los Angeles. Um, and then I guess the third thing would be just the incons- inconsistency. So you had Europa League games, you had some really good commentating, but then you had for the last <clears throat> a couple of years, you had uh, them really kind of testing different commentator duos and trying to see what was working. So they were, they were using that as an opportunity to see what would work for the World Cup. Um, so sometimes the coverage wasn't as great. Um, same with the Champions League and all the infomercials and the Grant Wall MLS uh, news section and I don't know, just inconsistency across the board. Um, and also a little bit stale too. Also, it became very, very predictable. Well, let me complain about that also with the Bundesliga. Everything you just said about the Bundesliga coverage as well. Yeah, it's been all all over the place. And, and and actually, at times it's been great. At times it's been okay, depending on who they have yeah, in that in, in, in that beer exactly. cellar, right? But, it's, it's, um, either, it's feast or famine with them uh, in their coverage of the Bundesliga. And as you just articulated that, Chris, I realized it was the same thing with uh, European, with UEFA coverage, that uh, it was feast or famine. Some some days they had the right mix of people in the studio, the right uh, right guys calling matches, all beat off of monitors, uh, Keith Costigan, what have you. Uh, some days, Alexi Lawless was really dialed in as a co-commentator. Some days he wasn't. Some days Warren Martin was really good. Some days he wasn't. Uh, Ian Joy has like three or four different roles, so uh, I don't want to critique all how he is in all those roles, but he's better in some than in others. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. It, consistency, I guess, would be my my takeaway on Fox. I think you just hit it. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's <laughs> okay. But yeah, I think the inconsistency is probably uh, uh, the lack of consistency is the most uh, uh, is the biggest takeaway from their coverage of all of these things. Yeah, it feels like an experiment. So, like they were just kind of just like uh, almost like we're guinea pigs, and they're, they're using us to figure out what what works best uh, going into the World Cup. And then here we have the World Cup, and what they're offering in terms of the teams set up with commentators in the booth is a big letdown. But that's a, another story for another time. All right, Kartik. So from this past week, um, we're not going to go into every single game, but um, what for you stood out? What what things that you saw this past week? Uh, were interesting uh, for for yourself and for the listeners. With this league final day, I already talked about. I thought Fox did a very good job. Premier League final day, NBC did a great job. Although I, I missed a lot of it because my satellite went out because of bad weather. But um, I thought that NBC, as usual, was 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 very strong, very consistent. They went through the storylines. They went through each club uh, and, and the implications afterwards and goals. And by the way, I did get to see the whole goal zone and. and 
and uh, the credit really downloaded after. So that was uh, that yeah. was good. Let me um, let me stop you there for a second because like with, just 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 to chime in. Um, so I watched the Premier League uh, final day. I missed the Bundesliga final day, but um, I did watch uh, Stoke against Swansea. Oh God! Uh, and, I, and also on the other TV, I had uh, Southampton against Man City on at the same time, thinking, hoping for a miracle. The miracle I didn't think was going to happen anyway, but it, it, obviously it didn't happen. But what, what I would say is that um, once the coverage was over, I kind of watched maybe about maybe about three or four minutes, and then I had to just switch it off just because I was thoroughly depressed. But it was really nice of NBC uh, across all the networks at the end of the games to show live footage of the scenes from Liberty Stadium in Swansea, and he had um, Lukas uh, Fabianski and Liam Britton crying after the final whistle yeah. during the lap, lap of honor. And I thought that was really good because they could have easily gone to Old Trafford or someplace else and, and shown some big, big clubs. Oh, oh, let me also point out that Fox, who never lets the coverage breathe after matches, okay, they never do. This is a big complaint about them. They learn, maybe from listening to this podcast, listening to what you just said, they learned with Hamburg. You gotta let it, you, you gotta let it breathe. And yeah. King Abdul let it breathe. And uh, obviously Hamburg's relegation. No offense to Swansea. Swansea uh, seventy Premier League would have missed them. But Hamburg is the, one of the great German clubs. Yeah, 50, fifty-five years. Right. Yeah, a huge deal. Yeah. Um, I, I I think Fox is now beginning to learn that lesson. Also, at the end, was it at the end of the Atlantic match yesterday? The Europa League. They let it breathe for a little bit. Or there was another recent match on Fox where. They, they didn't chime in right away. It wasn't right away, oh, let's go back to Rob Stone and get Alexi Lawless's and Warren Barton's take. It was a little bit of breathing. I, I think it might have been yesterday's finals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you wonder... Uh, I, I mean, it's a little bit too late for some of these things, though, uh, after all these years of coverage. But uh, maybe with the World yeah. Cup, hopefully that, that they'll let, let it... Well, I don't know. I can see them sending it back to the studio real quickly, uh, given how much money they spent on that studio, wanting to get that studio, uh, those faces and the analysts uh, on air quickly as possible. But um, anything else, Kartik, that stood out for you? Yeah, I mean, full of both legs. Look, there's a lot of uh, complaints about it being on ESPN+. Plus. Um, I don't know what they're going to do for the championship playoff final. Maybe we'll have some news about that. But uh, uh, a lot of disappointed people that they had to uh, that that was behind the paywall. But I watched both of that. Uh, Fulham is obviously uh, gone to the finals. Congratulations to them. Roma, you uh, Roma all over you uh, But uh, again, you as a result they win Serie A again. So uh, that's that. Levante Barça was an exciting game. Um, I think Ray Hudson was in a little bit of denial uh, as to what was happening, but that was that was a good one. I'm, I'm glad I watched that. I don't always watch uh, uh, these La Liga games when Barcelona and Real Madrid play lesser sides, but, but, but glad I watched that. Watched a bunch of MLS games. Uh, not not much uh, to take away from any of them. Uh, Europa League final we talked about, and then we uh, had a big Open Cup game here in, in South Florida yesterday between uh, Miami United and Miami FC. I just want to say congratulations to Roberto Saka. Uh, the owner of Miami United, who's one of the best guys in, in South Florida, best soccer guys, and uh, this is uh, the biggest win in the career, in the history of their their club, seven seasons. So uh, on to the next round of the U.S. Open Cup, they knocked off the giant here in South Florida, Miami FC. So congrats to them. So ESPN Plus, I haven't signed up for the uh, the trial yet. Uh, I'm going to jump in soon. I just been busy. Uh, but what I did have, though, Kartik, is uh, a tip for you and, and some of the listeners, too, is if you, if you are interested in the playoffs, so the championship playoffs, League One, League Two, etc., um, the games are being streamed live on TalkSport. Um, so you can just go to TalkSport.com and then just listen to them from through there. So I listened to the uh, Aston Villa against Middlesbrough game. And it wasn't the greatest game, the, the second leg of that one. But I was able to listen to the whole game. Uh, and for me, sometimes it's actually easier to listen to a radio broadcast of a game and then be working at the same time. Because uh, if it's a TV uh, broadcast, I'm, it's hard for me to look at both things at the same time. <laughs> so so we had uh, Sam Matterface and uh, Maddie Taylor uh, commentating. But um, that's definitely something to consider for if you're either at work or you don't have ESPN plus or you haven't uh, haven't signed up for ESPN plus like I have um. so I was working during both legs and in fact uh, on Monday I had some some colleagues in from London for sport we, uh, all of us uh, I have ESPN plus so I have to do it on my uh, iPad but we let John Champion tell the story right we weren't really watching um, yeah but so it kind of had the radio feel because obviously John Champion's a former radio announcer 
she's one of the best in the business. We talk about repeatedly on the show, but uh, he carried me through place. I'll have to say. Yeah, that, that's interesting you mentioned that too, Karthik, because somebody posted a comment on worldsoccertalk.com this week and said that we were talking about commentators and talking about uh, Fox's commentators for the World Cup and how disappointed he was. But he said, which is a good point, is that when he's watching games, he's not watching games. He's listening to, to the radio. He's listening to the commentary. So sometimes, like he said, he's busy. He has, a, I think, a pair of wireless headphones on, and he's busy even doing dishes or, or around the house cleaning up or looking after the kids or whatever. But with his wireless headphones on, he's listening to the game, what's happening, and he said that um, it was just a big disappointment in terms of uh, Fox's World Cup commentators and who they announced. And he said he would much prefer to have the World Feed, and I mean, whether it's uh, whoever it may, it, may, it may be, if it's... Um, well, I, well, we'll get into that in a little bit. Like, actually, I think we talked about that last week's episode. But the Wolf feed, like Peter Drury is on the Wolf feed and listening to that. Um, and that's why he said that, that the commentary is so important. And that's a good point. I mean, not everyone is like that person, but uh, it just goes to show how important the commentary is. All right, Kartik, let's move on to TV streaming news. Yeah, so uh, aforementioned uh, big news coming out of... Uh out of Turner Sports for Champions League coverage, Kate Abdo, uh, host uh, Champions League coverage for Turner. I want to note, uh, people are confused with this. She's going to continue to work for Fox at the same time. They're both going to have their studios in Los Angeles. Uh, she'll be doing Bundesliga coverage on the weekends for Fox uh, and then doing Champions League midweek for Turner. Yeah, so, so far, Steve Nash and uh, Kate Abdo are going to be uh, doing the coverage. So, Kate presenting Steve Nash, uh, the basketball star, as one of the analysts. No Americans yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and uh, I guess with Kate Abdo, too, she's going to be uh, in Atlanta. And supposedly, Steve Nash was going to be in an L.A. studio. So, it'll be interesting to see if they have some pundits maybe in the L.A. studio and then her hosting in Atlanta or how that's going to work uh, or if they'll all be in one studio in, in Atlanta perhaps. Uh, but uh, so far, so good. I mean, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I was talk talking to Turner Sports this week and uh, they said that there's going to be uh, no other announcements anytime soon. So we'll have to wait a little bit of time before we uh, find out uh, the rest of the crew. Yeah, I think uh, they'll probably make the announcements after the World Cup. And again, uh, well, if Kate Abdo's going to be Atlanta, I didn't realize that. Uh, they, they have the opportunity to pick up talent in the Southeast, and they have the opportunity with uh, the proximity to one of the largest bases of soccer in the country in Los Angeles to get people. So I, I'm fairly confident they'll be able to ramp up and, and, and put on a really good presentation, which is what they do for basketball. So the Champions League coverage will start in August and uh, from Turner Sports, uh, the, the new rights holder. And then um, a lot of the games will be streamed on BR Live. And uh, speaking of the Champions League, um, another rights holder to the Champions League in the United States, and that is Univision. And Univision will have the Spanish language rights uh, uh, starting this August all the way through to the end of the 2021 season. Now, a quote from the president, I believe, of uh, Univision, um, Deportes, and he says, this is Juan Carlos Rodriguez, he says, English-speaking soccer fans are welcome to join us if they don't want to pay to watch the matches on Turner, which is a good point. I mean, so for a lot of us who are thinking about, okay, uh, subscribing to BR Live, or uh, do we have all of the Turner stations on on Fubo, which, which are not there yet, um, and, and, and those other questions that come to mind is that uh, here we have the uh, Univision uh, Deportes president saying, hey, yeah, consider us. You, mean, you don't have to pay to watch uh, the Champions League or Europa League uh, with Univision. Uh, also, Univision, in that same article uh, that um, he was quoted in, uh, also expressed their interest in rights to La Liga. And then Rodriguez said that La Liga's high level of play would be of interest to Univision watchers. Uh, while noting that um, the circuit could could definitely benefit through broader viewership. So, Kartik, we've been talking about this for probably over a year, but La Liga, I think, has outgrown being sports. Uh, if you had La Liga on a major network in the United States, such as Univision, uh, not not even just the Barcelona Real Madrid games, but just uh, some of these other clubs, the, the Valencias, Atletis, etc., Sevilla. Uh, imagine what those ratings could be for those games, but uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid—that would be, in some way, in some way, Major League Soccer's worst nightmare. I mean, having these massive uh, teams 
on um, over the air television in the United States, you would imagine some massive numbers week in, week out. Yeah, I'm right. I, I, MLS's TV ratings continue to be uh, a major topic of conversation, and there are all these defenses that are given. Uh, I think if La Liga becomes more accessible, it becomes an, an even bigger problem for Major League Soccer. Uh, the, the big thing now for La Liga is to find that right partner that's going to take them, not only give them more access, but I think maybe give them this level of presentation that NBC Sports has given the Premier League because BN has done a very good job in terms of presentation with La Liga, much better, in my opinion, than Fox did with, uh, with the Premier League. So um, you're going to need to maintain that level of consistency in the presentation, but then be more accessible. That's, that's more difficult than just getting on a network that's going to be in more homes. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, maybe, maybe even you hire some of the, whoever the rights holder becomes, if, if it goes somewhere else, hire some of the VN personnel. But I think it's, it's a challenging uh, thing. And obviously, their, their, their partners, Media Pro, uh, I'm sure, are thinking about this. Yeah, and that's the thing, though, too, Kartik. I mean, I mean, you know, just just walking through a soccer field or walking just through the you know, United States of America, it took any any town, any shopping center, any mall. You see Real Madrid and, and Barcelona shirts everywhere, yes. and all, all ages are wearing them. Whether it's you mean know, grandmothers or kids or teens. And as I had to point out to an official from a German club uh, at Sportel, if you live in South Florida, you see Atleti shirts too, far more than you see Bayern Munich. So. Yeah. Um, there are other clubs. I mean, maybe it's just athletic, but there are other clubs that are also supported. It's not just a two-team league. I, I just, I always have to go through great pains to point that out because that was said by an official at Sportel, and I was thinking, that, I, no, that's not the case. Yeah. All. Yeah, in some ways, it could actually benefit uh, Major League Soccer, though, too, Kartik, because you could have double headers. You could have a, uh, a 2.45 to 4.45 Eastern kickoff on a Saturday game, uh, followed with by a Major League Soccer game right after that. I mean, we've seen the pairings that Major League Soccer has done, where they've tried to uh, combine with you know, everything from Premier League games to, I mean, you name it, uh, World Cup games. It hasn't worked, but maybe this one would. Maybe, but... The- La Liga's La Liga start times tend to be now they 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 adjusted some of their start times for the East market and and Lady, I mentioned it Lady, uh their ownership Wanda was at uh, uh was at a uh, uh, sport hotel spent some time with them uh, so there, there's some adjustment of, of TV of kickoff times for TV in Asia in La Liga but the bulk of La Liga games are still late start later and would compete head on with MLS matches unlike the Premier League and Bundesliga which are natural lead-ins. So maybe, I mean, I mean, maybe it just means MLS adjust their start times and play fewer afternoon matches. Um, yeah. Who knows? But yeah, it could it could help, but it also could be pretty intense competition. I think this is uh, this is a potential concern. I, I go with your initial yeah. instinct on it. But, but, but actually, having said that, though, too, I mean, I, I don't think the double header things are uh, work that well anyway, because you know, I mean, somebody has to make a conscious decision to watch that second game, or the I mean, we, in this case, it would be a second game because it's um, La Liga ends at about uh, four forty-five Eastern on a Saturday and, and a Sunday, so you could have a game right after that that would be a, a major league soccer game. But you'd have to make a con- conscious decision and say, you know what, I'm going to stick with this game. I'm, I'm going to watch another game too. Now, for some people, it's easier. They'll just leave, leave the TV on and hope that uh, the ratings will go up that way. But I think it's uh, if the quality is good enough, people will watch it. It's not a slam dunk, but it would op- op- uh, open up the opportunity to introduce Major League Soccer to some people that maybe haven't watched it in a while. But, but by this stage, though, I mean, with Major League Soccer on Univision, on Fox, you mean on ESPN, I think uh, by this point, I think everyone that would have... Uh, wanted to pay attention to it probably gave it a chance and has either moved on or always watching it but um uh, maybe it, maybe it's i don't know who knows we'll have to wait and see i can't take it let's move on to the next news item yeah itv has unveiled its uh, team for the 2018 fifa world cup in Ru- uh, russia a uh, lot of familiar names uh the, uh, on this coverage, I'm not going to run through all of them, but just a few of them. Uh, there'll be uh, there'll be studio pundits like Gary Neville, Ryan Giggs, Roy Keane, Ian Wright, Lee Dixon, Martin O'Neill, on and on and on. Uh, the uh, commentators will be John Champion, uh, Clyde Tilsley, uh, Joe Spate, and a few others. Uh, co-commentators will include Glenn Honnell, Ali McCoy, uh, Ian Dowie, who's been kind of familiar on ITV, among others. So. Uh, uh, a lot. You can check out uh, the full news about ITV and also your thoughts about uh, or our thoughts about your uh, 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 promotions on WorldSoccerTalk.com. 
Yeah, so uh, so let's talk about the BBC too, because like so um, so on WorldSoccerTalk.com, we've we've got the trailer for the ITV World Cup uh, that they're promoting it to to advertise it uh, to well, people in the UK, but obviously around the world we can see that too. That was interesting. Um, but now the BBC, the BBC has uh, announced their team, so they're going to feature hosts uh, Gary Lineker and Gabby Logan, and the studio analysts will be Alan Shearer, Frank Lampard, Rio Ferdinand. Jurgen Klinsmann, uh, Didier Drogba, and uh, Pablo Zabaleta. Plus, as far as uh, also, they'll have uh, Phil Neville, Jermaine Genus, Danny Murphy, Matt, uh, Martin Keown, and Alex Scott. Now, the commentators and co commentators will be Guy Mowbray, Steve Wilson, Jonathan Pierce, Steve Bauer, Simon Brotherton, and Vicky Sparks, and co commentators Kevin Kilban and Mark Lawrenson. And uh, the BBC is going to televise 33 live games. And then uh, I think it's the ITV is doing 32. So strong cast. I mean, to me, the ones that are most interesting to me are uh, Drogba. I'd love to hear what his analysis is like uh, in the studio. Uh, but also Klinsman. I, I think Klinsman actually, I, I mean, there's a lot of fans that, um, especially in the United States, that give him a hard time. Um, but as an analyst on television, which is what, how he got the job in the first place, if you remember, Carter, like, was it 2010 World Cup? Where he's working for ESPN and doing some great analysis, brought him front and center uh, into the homes of, across the United States. Uh, I don't know. I, he's a good analyst. If, so. if, that, if, if giving manifestos on television is a criteria, I, I <laughs> nominate Kyle Martino to be the next U.S. men's national team coach. Because what he said yesterday, I thought about Klinsman's rant that got him the, 2011, the job in 2011, the 2010 rant in South Africa, which was spot on, by the way, when Klinsman said that on ESPN. Um, and, I, and I thought, you know, Kyle has taken it to another level. I was sitting in Sportel yesterday. He's making all the same points, making them, I think, a little more succinctly and making them a little more logically in, in terms of the entire framework. But, yeah, Klinsman's interesting on air. And the other guy, I think that I, I, I enjoy um, that will be good uh, on that BBC team is Pablo Zavaleta. I mean, maybe this is some of my biases of Manchester City support, but I think he's going to be uh, – He's going to be very, very uh, analytical and give a, a perspective that is needed, a South American perspective, having played a decade in England, but a South American perspective uh, that's needed for their coverage. Now, Carl, I'm going to put you on the spot here. But uh, So the ITV names we named and the BBC names, uh, can you think of anyone on the Fox's coverage from the studio analysis that you're looking forward to, to listening to, to, to give their perspective on the World Cup? People who are in, uh, at Fox are asking. You're not asking me to analyze. But well, you're, just just like, like just think of a couple of people within Fox that are going to be in Russia doing the analysis in the studio for the World Cup coverage. Uh, well, he's a co commentator uh, in the studio. Uh, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm thinking now. I mean, Gus Hiddink, maybe. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. There's got to be somebody. That, I, I mean, it's it's your, your usual crew, of course. You got Alex, Alexi Lalas, uh, Ali Wagner. Okay, Ali Wagner's one. Well, she's she's a co-commentator though. Well, she, I mean, so well, she's in the studio though. Okay, so I, I look forward to her. Uh, I look forward to Stu Holden's co-commentary. Uh, as far as studio analysts, uh, uh, did we say Kelly Smith was part of the team? No, she's not part of the team. I don't. Um, I don't believe so. Who else is in the studio for them? He think you mentioned. He, I think he's okay. It was uh, yeah, Lothar Mateus, um, okay. Hernan Crespo. Ah, uh, so they have Lothar Mateus. That's why European Klinsman can't work for them. Ah, there we go. Uh, Hernan Crespo, <laughs> not really. Um, yeah, well, yeah, they, 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 like, people don't know the history of German football. That is a nasty feud between Mateus and and, and Klinsman. But uh, yeah. Uh, continue. So, but, 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 but more, more, more so, it's more me making a point in terms of, you I mean, I have to, th I've been writing about this, I've been analyzing this, and if you ask me right off, you I mean, at the top of my head, who, who am I looking forward to for that studio analysis? I, I'm thinking Stuart Holden, but he's going to be doing the commentating for a lot of these yeah. games. And I'm sure when he has breaks, uh, when he's not doing commentating games, uh, he will be in the studio in Moscow, but depending on travel arrangements and where well, he's going to be. Well, let's see, because, I mean, ESPN did such a brilliant job of that, of bringing T Taylor Twelman and, and, and uh, Maka uh, at the Euros in 2016. France is a smaller country, right, to travel around. But uh, bringing uh, Twelman and Maka into the studio, 
uh, in their bumper programming, often between matches, uh, if they weren't calling matches that day. Mm -hmm. And adding another layer to the, to the analysis. Uh, will Fox be able to do that with Stu Holden? Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, because I think, I think he's so. emerging as their star yeah. to the point that they're going to have to they're gonna have to utilize him as much as possible. Um, and uh, uh, obviously give him some breaks in, in the tournament. There are days traveling around. But I think, uh, yeah, I would build a lot of their coverage around Holden because they did have the strength of other personalities uh, on their team. So Kartik, remember the last two World Cups, and, and, and to me, the standout star as far as the analysis in the studio was was uh, Taylor Twelman. I mean, he killed it, yeah. and and that that's a huge loss. As a, not having him, you mean, kind of any, anyone television uh, for for Fox, obviously, because uh, this summer because they, they've lost ESPN lost the rights, but that's a huge hole to fill, and. Uh, so I think Stuart Holden's probably going to be doing a lot of uh, traveling back and forth, and hopefully they'll get to use him. Um, and then maybe that he'll be able to, you mean, uh, start up some good conversations. Or maybe maybe he enjoy. I know he's supposed to be a, supposed to be a presenter, but maybe they'll put him into the the analyst role too. Um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's, it's, they're going to have a hard job trying to uh, hold and captivate the audience and have have them stay because you, you don't have a. Roberto Martinez, you don't have uh, Taylor Twellman, you don't have um, a, a Maca, et cetera. All right, Kartik, just a couple more news items before we move on. Yeah, um, so the Supreme Court has uh, ruled that uh, has essentially legalized sports uh, sports gambling in the United States, although it's uh, being implemented on a state-to-state on -state basis. Uh, that happened this week. Uh, uh, get your thoughts on that, Chris. My initial thoughts are that um, it could be a boon for television companies. I'm not a fan of gambling. I come from a very soccer perspective on this stuff. I uh, am concerned because I know the salaries. I've worked in the game. I know the salaries of um, many of the players who play in American soccer. I'm concerned about match fixing. So I'm not, I'm not thrilled about the decision personally. Uh, but uh, I, I think it could be a boon in other areas of, of, of media and, and the games. Yeah, I, I don't come from a ba gambling uh, background either. Or you I mean it's it's a it's a really foreign thing to me, and it's weird because when I do have conversations with people from around the world, a lot of it um, is from a, g a gambling angle, which uh, which I always like. Well, uh, I I don't look at it that way, but but it is. Uh, but but even like American sports too, whether it's basketball or March Madness or NFL, a lot of people are talking about it from a gambling perspective, and I I, I don't get I, I understand, but I just can't really relate to that. This is going to change everything, Kartik, in terms of anything to do with sports. Um, television, it's going to take a, a while, probably a few years before this rolls out. And of course, it's going to be a state by state decision, which is going to make things even more complicated. But I can see a lot more advertising on television, um, a lot more advertising on um, on websites. I mean, anything to do with sports, I, I can see um, MLS uh, sponsors changing to going from, you mean, Herbalife to now uh, William Hill or DraftKings. I can expect to see a lot more infomercials on Fox Sports for DraftKings this summer. Um, it's going to change everything. And it, it's a good thing in terms of being a stimulus, in, especially at this time with uh, soccer in the United States from a U.S. perspective, from a um, U.S. soccer perspective, um, really losing out millions in not being at the World Cup this summer. Uh, the timing of this is actually good for for the sport. Um, there's a lot of bad things that can happen from this, but uh, hopefully, um, hopefully the state governments or the federal government will be able to go ahead and set up this criteria in, in such a way uh, to make this a win-win for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I have a lot of anxiety about, about gambling being legal. I have to be honest. I know this might be it's a foreign concept to me also, but it's a concept that I'm quite frankly worried about as someone who's concerned about the integrity of sports. I understand it also drives interest. And um, people tell me, have told me in the last few days, hey, this stuff is happening anyway. You you, you have your blinders on. This Now, now we can regulate. It. Now we can actually watch it uh, if you're concerned about match fixing and things like that. So that's possible too. But mm -hmm. um, like you, Chris, it's a completely foreign thing to me. And I, I, always, I often, like you, get lost when people start giving me the gambling angle to, <laughs> to watch matches. I actually don't understand it. Yeah, me too. Me too, yeah. All right, one last news item. And I, th I saw this and I thought it was of interest, and that is uh, YouTube TV, which is the uh, streaming uh, service offered by YouTube, and you can get you mean, Fox and other channels through this. Uh, they're losing $60 million a year 
with no obvious path to not losing money, says an analyst. So interesting that um, they're losing money already, but with YouTube uh, being owned by Google Alphabet, I'm sure you mean the, the runway that they've got is quite long, so they've definitely got a lot of funding available to keep it going. But so far as a streaming uh, service, they're losing $60 million a year. Moving on to TV ratings. Now, Kartik, uh, a big number that came out from this past week, um, actually from last week, was 3.6 million people watched the uh, Liga MX, uh, Ligia uh, semifinal between uh, Club America and Santos Laguna over the two legs. So the, the first leg, I believe, was on the Thursday last week, and that got 1.4 million. And then the second leg got 2.1 million uh, on Univision and Univision Deportes uh, Network. So huge numbers there for Liga Mackies. Um, some of the other numbers that came out. So we had the final day of coverage of the Premier League. Uh, the Liverpool-Brighton game on NBC uh, had uh, 768,000 viewers, which is pretty decent when you comp- uh, consider that there were nine, nine other matches going on in the Premier League. Uh, obviously, the other games didn't get as many, but... Um, all in all, it uh, seemed to be a pretty good day for the Premier League. Yeah, I think it, it, I, I, I did a little quick math in my head and combined numbers were about 1.3, 1.4 million. So uh, for all those games, which is uh, we're a little more than that, actually. So that, that's uh, a, uh, a pre... And that's just the numbers we have, right? We don't have the number right. from uh, Bravo, for instance, for the match they were showing. Uh, so that's actually pretty good. 10 a.m. on a Sunday... Um, not as much was on the line as in previous years on the final match day. Uh, yep. But uh, uh, obviously Liverpool getting back into Champions League was the big story. Now for me, I wanted to see Spurs won and Spurs finished ahead of Liverpool because it's one of my favorite stats in all of uh, football right now is that now Liverpool, uh, Tottenham's finished ahead of Liverpool eight times in the last nine seasons. Incredible from a historical perspective, particularly if you're a Spurs fan. But um, yeah, I was surprised by the numbers. I thought they were much better than... Uh, I had thought for the Premier League this week. And, and MLS had a, a, I wouldn't say a strong weekend, but a stronger weekend than they've been having. Yeah, uh, the Dallas LA Galaxy game, 395,000 viewers on Univision on Saturday afternoon. That, that's, a, that's a good number. Uh, the Bundesliga final day of the season on Fox uh, had Hoffenheim against Dortmund. That one had 329,000 viewers. Um, some of the other numbers, like, the only one, other one that stands out for me is Portland against Seattle, which is really kind of, a, MLS positions this as a, a marquee matchup, kind of one of the big games of the year. This was on ESPN on Sunday from 4 to 6 uh, p.m. Eastern, and that had uh, 231,000 viewers. So that tells me that uh, uh, even though it's portrayed as a marquee matchup, um, there's not that much interest. I mean- Timing again. Okay, so let's talk about La Liga. Let's talk about the La Liga game that was on on, on uh, BN and Espanol, which was Levante and Barca. Let's talk yeah. about the Serie A match that was on at the same time on BN, BN in English, uh, which was uh, uh, Roma and, and uh, uh, Juventus, the match I was watching. I watched the second half of that MLS match. Uh, those games spilled into um, the MLS coverage, if I recall correctly. I mean, might be. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I, I think that, again, this goes back to a conversation we had earlier in the show. The competition, if La Liga is on a, a, a more distributed network, it's a problem for MLS, unless they can piggyback on it. So uh, this, this number uh, is disappointing to me, and, and, and the, uh, the Orlando number 285 is much better. I, I watched the, that entire game. But um, I... I I think it has to do with the competition from other soccer properties at the same time. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing, though, too. I mean, they know that ahead of time when they schedule these these games. Um, so, I mean, Major League Soccer knows that going into it. So, obviously, they must think, I don't know, there's a lot of variables involved. I mean, you could push back the games. Uh, but then it, get, then it depends on ESPN and their availability. And they got Sports Center. I mean, so you don't want to... Uh, it, it's not easy for, by any means. I, I had one person on WorldSoccerTalk.com this week said uh, he wished that uh, Major League Soccer games could be on at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, Eastern time on Saturdays or Sundays just because um, it would be easier for them to go ahead and get better TV ratings. Uh, but then you're up against you mean, the Premier League or Bundesliga or you mean, Serie A, La Liga. Or like you taking their kids to youth soccer matches. I mean, right. I, I, don't, I don't think that solves... Yeah, I think. I, I mean, we have a million answers for this, but the, <laughs> the, the, the problem persists. And, and let me let me just throw this out from Sportel this week. Kyle Martino, 
Uh, I asked him the question directly. Kyle Martino believes that there is a lack of relevance and context around a lot of the matches for fans outside of those cities. If you have an open system, now of course he was advocating pro rel, but if you have an open system, people are more interested. I do think that has a lot to do with it, though. I agree with Martino. Yeah. So, um, there just isn't any relevance to these matches. The other point that Kyle Martino made, let me, while we're on this, um, Kyle Martino made a point that I did not think about. He said, we love it. We, we say we love playoffs in the U.S. Why are the ratings for MLS Cup going down every year? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we've talked about that on this episode, on, on this uh, podcast before, too, where the, the numbers are going down. If the MLS playoffs was such a big deal that everyone loved and got around the playoff uh, concept, those numbers would be huge. But then the timing of it is at, uh, I mean, at the time of college football and NFL football, and it's on Sundays and sometimes it's on, on midweek games. But yeah, I, I mean, to me, at the end of the day, there's, there's so many excuses. But at the end of the day, if the quality of the soccer is good enough, people will, will make make a, find a way to watch it. And no matter what time of the day you, you put it on, no, no matter what day of the week you put it on, if it's good enough, they will find it, they will watch it. Martino's um, point was... Quality, yes, uh, and he did talk about that, but he also said uh, just having now covered the Premier League for five years at NBC, relegation is such a driver of storylines at the end of the season and driving interest that um, if you don't have it, he thinks that's, uh, again, he was advocating pro in in the interest of full disclosure, uh, that he believes in that and obviously had carried for U.S. soccer president on that, but um, he said he thinks that definitely affects ratings that you don't have a relegation fight and you don't have context for people in other cities who may aspire to be in that league because it's a closed system yeah 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 definitely it's uh a lot of factors involved and uh it's not pretty. Uh, so let's move on, Kartik. Uh, listen to the mailbag. Uh, the first comment we've got, this is from Edition by Relegation, uh, and uh, he tweeted at us this. And actually, we got a bunch of tweets about this. Uh, and uh, anyway, I'll, I'll read it. I don't think Bleacher Report Live has any control over the clock on the Scottish League matches. I watched Scottish matches when Fox Sports to go carried them until last year, and it was exactly the same. And uh, addition by relegation and, and all the other uh, listeners who sent us tweets and messages. Um, yep, w- we were wrong on that one. Part of it for me is that um, it's been a while since I've been able to watch uh, Scottish Premiership because last season, or actually this past season, uh, which is coming to an end, it was all it was not available on US uh, other than directly streaming through Celtic TV or Rangers TV. And I wasn't going to pay like two hundred dollars just to to watch that. And then I think last season it was on was it Fox Soccer to Go? But I don't think I watched many of those games anyway. So it's been a few years since I've been able to watch the Scottish Premiership, and uh, and that's why Kartik, as far as that clock, that diamond shaped clock, that's a, actually an SPL thing, which is interesting. Next up is uh, Juan Mendoza, and he tweeted us this. He says the LAFC attendance has actually been strong, but uh, faces similar situation that Galaxy attendance has. Very late arrivals. Most people show up at uh, the minimum of uh, 30 minutes into the match. And for their first midday game in the heat on Saturday, most people were standing in the shade. Only the supporters section guts it out. Uh, Next up is Dermot McQuarrie, and he posted this on Facebook. He says, uh, morning from sunny Glasgow. Got a chance finally to listen to this week's podcast. Overall, I like the podcast and a good variety of topics. The Wayne Rooney to DC is certainly interesting to follow. Unlike Bex, who is a real family man, uh, Rooney has quite a reputation for liking being out on the town. I wonder if Colleen and the children will stay, uh, come or stay, or or just make flying visits. Uh, The LAFC not being a sellout and only about 65% is concerning. Uh, there is, of course, a tendency in the U.S. for been there, done that, uh, bought the T-shirt. So LAFC has to really start marketing their product to the locals. Uh, they have the advantage of being close to the city, unlike the Galaxy, where you need to ca- uh, need, you need a car for home games. Keep up the good work. Diane Engler uh, sent us an email, and uh, she said, Did you know that the sportscasters on the Tottenham Leicester game on Sunday at least three times gave false information about what would happen if Spurs lost and came in fourth in the Premier League? They claimed that Spurs would have to go through a qualifying round for the Champions League unless they came in third. This is not true. The rules have changed. Why don't um, the commentators know this? It's embarrassing. 
there was a lot of misconceptions about that, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with Diane, but also I, I was surprised the number of people in the business who didn't realize that beginning next season, uh, the format of the Champions League and, and qualification from uh, the four largest leagues or the four most uh, successful leagues, Italy, England, Germany, and uh, Spain is different than it has been in the past. But yeah, uh, good point. Uh, but she's right. I mean, it, it, fourth place was automatically in. Uh, yeah. I thought it was a Spurs to finish third just to uh, keep that stat that I mentioned earlier going. But yeah, in reality, it, it didn't matter in terms of uh, group stage versus uh, plan. Yeah, that's one of those things you would hope that the commentators know that. But uh, sometimes that, that news or that change can get lost. Uh, but then still uh, have lost in, in an email inbox or, you I mean, there's so much information out there. But at the same time, the, the, the commentators should know that. Steven Santos uh, sent us an email. He said, uh, I have been a Newcastle United fan for my whole life. I'm turning 35 this year. I have seen relegation battles and three times Newcastle has been relegated in my lifetime. I also despise teams like Hull City, Sunderland, Middlesbrough, etc. for beating us on the last weeks of those years to knock us into the uh, Division One and now to the Championship. Uh, it is depressing to go down and then to try to watch Newcastle, which is hard to watch and find on TV. Rather, most of the time I'm listening to BBC Newcastle radio three years ago. I didn't even watch the Premier League at all. I was just trying to follow Newcastle games to get promoted. I have more respect for fans in the Championship because of my team, Newcastle, getting relegated and winning the Championship three times and proving themselves worthy of the top fights again. Uh, top flights again, uh, but so much frustration, depression, sadness, and then and then joy of winning it or to get back up to the summit, which is the Premier League. I, ha I hate the situation and mockery that Swansea City was put in by Southampton police and hotels. It's one thing uh, to make noises and pester Swansea, the team, but cancel uh, their rooms and not even provide security or police escort is downright dangerous. And, and let me just add to that, too. It wasn't the Southampton police. It was, um, I think, the South Wales police that didn't give the Southampton uh, bus a, a, an escort to the stadium. Uh, and also the hotel situation was a, was a Swansea hotel. Had nothing to do with Swansea City, the, the football club, but um, was the hotel nearest the ground uh, that is the, the best quality hotel in, in the area. Um, he goes on to say, I would be mad as a Newcastle supporter if this happened to my team during a relegation battle, and my team has been relegated before also. It's tough to be a fan of teams that can spend money uh, sometimes, and then other times look barely like a, like a championship side team. Best wishes to Swansea in the championship, and I hope you guys keep uh, Carvajal and get promoted right away next year to the Premier League. Last but not least, Dave Brunk uh, sent us an email. He says, why does Fox and other networks uh, commentate matches from their, their location in the U.S. rather than using the world feed. Assuming English language is available, wouldn't that be cheaper for them and possibly more enjoyable for us? Hmm. So, che so cheaper, yes, because um, however much they pay for the rights fee for, say, the Champions League, well, yeah, say the Champions League or, or, or the World Cup, that comes with the feeds automatically. Uh, would it be possibly more enjoyable for us? I think most of the listeners would agree and say yes. But what Fox wants to do is really put their stamp on it. They want to say, okay, this is a Fox broadcast. They want to have uh, complete control over the commentators as far as having, say, Derek Ray uh, give a promo for uh, World Cup tonight. And coming up later, we've got Fernando Fiore talking about blah, 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 whatever. whatever. Uh, as well as being able to kind of have a chat about... Uh, all the great things that Rob Stone said in, said in the studio, and don't you agree, uh, Tony Miola or Ali Wagner? What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, facetious, but, um, but but that's really why they want to just put their stamp on on it and also have the control on it, um, so that uh, if people say, okay, that World Cup coverage was fantastic. Well, Fox can say, okay, well that was our coverage. Uh, we're not in, in control of the the video feed from the games. Um, but we do have our commentators, and we can own it. We, this is ours. So, and, and that applies to World Cup and Champions League and everything else. You can always reach us uh, via email if you have any questions, feedback, or comments, or anything, advice, you, you name it. We're here to help uh, through web at worldsoccertalk.com, as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk, and on Twitter at worldsoccertalk. Plus, of course, you can get uh, you can post your comments on the, the main website, worldsoccertalk.com. 
Now, Kartik, uh, thanks for listening uh, and listeners. Uh, you can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, AudioBoom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review. And Kartik, going into another final weekend of uh, European soccer, as well as Major League Soccer, and getting ready for the World Cup, um, what should they do this weekend? Enjoy your football. <laughs> <laughs>